Good morning, church. Um, this morning we are reading from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Now the words will be on the screen behind me. If you want to read along with me. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want for me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for this space this morning where you are meeting us, where you have made yourself known to us in whatever way um, as we come this morning bearing joy, burdens, um, pain, hopes. Um, God, you are right with us. And I'm just reminded, thinking about this, there are so many ways in which we um, ourselves are blind, even of our own making, things that have been done to us or things we have done. And I'm just just reminded that, God, you can make us see. Jesus, you provide sight to us. So I pray that this morning the words of your healing power will come to us powerfully this morning, that we can trust you, um, that we will find peace and rest in who you are. God, I pray for Trey as he brings this message. Holy Spirit, just empower him to speak what is true. We ask this all in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Daniel. Um, just in light of your prayer, um, I want to just invite you, uh, I'm going to give you some space to pray and just ask um, God to uh, maybe reveal to you any places that maybe you are uh, blind, things that you may not see, and ask just God to, to help you to see. So I just want to um, give you a moment. You can start by saying something like, come Holy Spirit, search me and know me. Um, and just ask if the Lord would have uh, anything come up. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, if you were here with us uh, last week, which uh, some, of you, uh, some of you were and a number of you uh, weren't, uh, something happened last week. Uh, something different, something unexpected. So um, if you were here last week and this is your first time uh, here with us, uh, things look slightly different. Uh, our trailer went out. Um, it was like being pulled back into my driveway a couple weeks ago and I noticed one of the tires was smoking, which is not what a tire is supposed to do, uh, in case you were wondering. Uh, really thankful that uh, dear friend Travis uh, Bug over here took the trailer to get fixed, um, but it was out last week, and so we kind of loaded everything individually. We have these rolling cases out there that we load everything in and set it up, tear down every single Sunday, but last week we just took everything individually and brought it in, so it definitely took a little bit more work, so we didn't have uh, pipe and drape. There are probably other things that were missing um, as well. We Luckily, we barely missed anything except we got here and we realized we didn't have coffee, um, Thankfully, Sarah went to my house and went and picked up coffee there because Lord knows we need some of that in the morning. Um, but a number of things happened uh, last week. So that happened. Um, I went to go edit my um, sermon video from last week, and I was like, oh, there was no audio coming from my mic. None was recorded. Cool. Um, also, right before our gathering, I just felt like I sense God might be inviting me to do something that I've never done on a Sunday gathering before, which is to completely ditch the sermon that I had planned and had to run through. And so I was like, okay, let's go. Let's do it. Um, and so that's what we did. And God has a habit of disrupting our plans. It's not to say we don't plan. I think planning can be great and empowered by the Holy Spirit. But God uh, has a way of disrupting our plans. And so I'm rolling with it. 
I want to go where he goes. I want to be in step with him. So we, if you've been with us for a little longer, we have been in a series on the practice of fasting. Um, We've been in that, well, we were in it for two weeks. We were supposed to be in it for four weeks. This was supposed to be week four. As I mentioned, we didn't do week three, which was about uh, fasting as a way of amplifying our prayers. And then this week was supposed to be fasting as an act of standing in solidarity with the poor. Um, Needless to say, we're going in a different direction, just kind of in sense of what I think is uh, uh, obedience. And so last week what we did is we talked through Jesus' invitation in Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus said, come to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. And what we ended doing was something that was also strange and uh, not our typical gathering, which is that we kind of uh, broke into groups and uh, gave space to bring these things to God and receive prayer. Um, And this was following the instructions from James chapter 5 to confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed, that the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. I believe there's freedom to be found in Jesus, freedom to be found in stepping into the light, freedom to be found in bringing that thing that lurks in the dark to the surface and inviting the transformative power of Christ to heal you. And in reflection, prayer, and conversation around uh, last week, the question that came to my mind was Jesus' question in this passage. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? This man could have said anything, right? Riches, fame, success. But he said, I want to see. And Jesus tells him, your faith has healed you. And this man could immediately see and follow Jesus down the road. You may hear that and say, of course, that's what he did. If Jesus made me be able to see and I was blind, of course, that's what I would do too. So let me ask you the question. What do you want from Jesus? What do you want him to do for you? What if Jesus looked at you with all kindness, tenderness, gentleness, empathy, compassion, and asked you, what do you want? What do you want? What would you say? For some of us, the answer is obvious, and frankly, we've been asking him. We've kept asking, we've been begging him, both with words and with tears. We've done it both alone and invited other people to pray for us. And frankly, a passage like this where Jesus says, your faith has healed you, is kind of like a conundrum. What do I do with this? Because this has not been my experience. Is this true or is my experience true or in some weird way or both? And then what do I do with that? Are you all good or are you all powerful? But surely you can't be both of these things. Others of us perhaps haven't even considered the question. Maybe we've not even thought of what it is that you ultimately want. Or maybe you have considered it, but you've never thought about bringing it to him and asking. There may be a couple broad temptations here in regards to our relationship with God with this in prayer, coming to God with things. One would be that we would avoid asking God for things. Maybe it's out of uh, a lack of trust. You don't think he can You worry that he can't? Or perhaps, maybe more realistically for a number of us, it's a fear of disappointment. What if I do ask and then for whatever reason he does not? Wouldn't it just feel better not to ask in the first place and not have to deal with this? Others of us though, uh, and depending on your tradition, may treat prayer as a way of like a magical formula. That if I pray something with enough faith, for healing, for God to answer a prayer, then he is going to respond in power. That you will get the thing that you ask for. What we're left with, though, is neither of those. It's something far more mysterious. Is Tyler Staten, who's a pastor in Portland, Oregon, and wrote uh, in his book, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. What we're left with is something far more mysterious. He wrote that we see a God who miraculously healed a leper only to go on living in a world with leper colonies. 
What we see in this story is a God who heals a blind man only then for more blind children to be born the same day. He writes, we see a God who displays healing power and also chooses personal suffering, namely on the cross, as the means to final healing. And he wrote that I know the power of God and the silence of God, and sometimes I'd think I'd handle the silence better if power was never on the table at all. A God with a personality and will is so unpredictable. God is a lot more mysterious than a formula that we can invoke where God does respond in prayer and he answers prayers and he works in power, but other times it seems like we pray and pray and pray and it's not for a lack of faith. I think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying with full trust in the Father. Lord, if you're, Father, if you're willing, take this cup of suffering from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Did Jesus not have ultimate trust in the Father? He obviously did. Can I just encourage us? If this is you, the fact that you are wrestling with God in an immense pain over his seeming silence is not an indication of your lack of faith. It actually is more than likely an indication of true faith because if you didn't have faith in the first place, it wouldn't hurt like this. It wouldn't be this painful. As Satan points out, you're left wondering, is God all good? Or is he all-powerful? Because surely he can't be both. This, for some of us in the room, is our heavy burden that we carry, that Jesus invites us to bring to him. It's what's making you tired, worn out, depleted. It's the thing that you have, have already brought to him and begged him to do something. You're like, come to me. Okay, I've been doing it. You say you'll give me rest. Where is it? You've begged him to do something, only not to experience it yourself. Perhaps you've even watched others come in desperation, praying the same prayer that you're praying. And you see their prayers answered, but not yours. Maybe you've had him answer the prayers before, and you're left wondering, God, are you there? Do you care? Am I wrong? I know you're not a genie in the bottle, I get that, but you also respond to persistent prayer, so which one is it? You can move in power, and you tell us to ask, so... I'm doing those, and I'm saying that you do, but you don't seem to be listening to me. Tyler Staten wrote that God, when we pray, he collects more than just the words wedged between dear God and amen. He also collects our tears. Psalm 56 reads, you have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle, are they not in your book? He describes that prayer is asking, it's begging God to do something, asking him to move in power, but prayer, he says, is also weeping. In the middle of a mess so thick we can't see up but can only scream through tears. Lord, I can't bear it any longer. He goes on to say the psalmist tells us in Psalm 126, five, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Not only will God collect every tear, but he'll redeem every tear. God is not merely bottling up our tears. He also promises that when they touch the earth, they'll bring renewal. Every tear of ours that falls to the ground will grow the fruit of redemption. God bends history so that the moments of greatest pain becomes the become the moments of greatest redemption, twisting the story to be sure that the pain we feel releases the power of new life and the tears we cry become the foundation of a better world. We are promised that a day is coming when the Father himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes, but until then we live on an in-between promise, I will not let a single one of your tears be wasted. Satan goes on to describe how we pray to an un fathomably loving father who collects our prayers like love letters and collects our tears like fine wine. Parker Palmer, who's a spiritual writer, wrote that the deeper our faith, the more doubt we must endure. The deeper our hope, the more prone we are to despair. The deeper our love, the more pain its loss will bring. These are a few of the paradoxes we must hold as human beings if we refuse to hold them in the hopes of living without doubt, despair, and pain. We also find ourselves living without hope, faith, and love. And so if you find yourself just in a posture of walking through something really painful and continually bringing it to the Lord, almost the word that comes to mind is like, well done, good and faithful servant. 
It's not an indication of your lack of faith. It might be precisely an indication of your faith and your trust. You see, pain can harden us, and it also can soften us. And what Satan says is what we have to do is to invite God, the very one who seemed to break our trust, the very one who we have labeled as perpetrator to be our healer. He says it's the most courageous of all choices. It's desperation. It's crying out for healing. We come to God seeking something. What do you want me to do for you? And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes he answers and gives it to us. And he delights in doing so. And I'll pray that for you. But what we are promised is that we get him. We get his presence. Not always in a highly emotive way like breaking down in tears or being caught up in awe and wonder in a moment of worship or just the Holy Spirit falling on a room. Not always like that, but in that. Plus the gentle presence of a breath, the rustling of the wind. As sure as the sun rises in the morning and sets in the evening, it's an assurance that for all who follow Jesus, he will never leave us or forsake us. Psalm 27, verse 4 says this. The psalmist says, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. Tyler Staten pointed out in his book that before prayer is really anything else, it's about love. It's about relationship, intimacy with God. And what I think was so encouraging to me about last week and what I really do believe was pleasing to the Father was honesty. Crying out in desperation, the honest labeling of the situation, no pretending, no facades, just reality. I read it somewhere and I can't uh, remember where I read it and if someone in the room does, I would love to know uh, where it's from. That God doesn't meet us anywhere other than where we are. In other words, God isn't in the business of meeting us in some hypothetical reality that doesn't exist. God meets us in the present moment where we are. The question is, are you even there? Are you operating in reality? Are you having an honest expression of this is where I'm at, this is what's going on, this is my life right now? No pretending, no facades, that's where God meets us. Jesus is described as Emmanuel, God with us. Not God with hypothetical you. Not the you that would be further along at this age or in this stage of life or would be feeling different than you feel. You, God with us now, here, present, in this moment. Not you if you were in another church this morning. You here, me here. Um, I recently spent some time, as I mentioned uh, several times uh, recently at Asbury University where they experienced an outpouring of the Holy Spirit for 16 days. And they gave us kind of a chance um, to like see underneath the hood of what it was like to see people who were kind of shepherding the moment and the movement. And kind of what they said um, was like, come open up the hood, poke around, see, ask questions. I'm just here to tell you what I saw what I experienced, that I experienced the Lord, I experienced the presence of God in a profound sort of way. And one of the uh, people who sort of grandfathered uh, this moment and helped shepherd it and empowering younger leaders was a man named David Thomas, uh, who spoke about what led to great awakenings in the church, movements of the spirit that spread out uh, pa past even an individual place and moved past that. And as part of his PhD, he spent time going to interview some of the surviving people from the uh, Hebridean revival, which was in northern Scotland, what at the time some historians describe as the last real awakening in the Western world. And he got to go and interview some of the people who were there in this, these communities in northern Scotland, asking, what was it? What led to this? What like made space for this? Like, I, I want this. I want to move with the Spirit of God. I want God to show up. That's what we say we're after, right? Was it preaching? Was it methodology? Was it some really cool, incredible thing? Like, how can we take that and replicate it? Sure, those things mattered. There was, there was preaching. There was methodology. There was all that. But I want you to hear this um, from him, and this is a, a, lengthy, a lengthy quote, um, and I'll tell you if I break from it, but I'm going to be reading from him. 
he heard this from men and women now in their 80s, and he said it was often um, with tears as they still recounted the stories. He said they described something more essential, a kind of spiritual posture found among some who were the catalytic core, a spirit of urgency and audacity, an attitude of brokenness and desperation, a manner of prayer that could be daring and agonizing. These friends in the Hebrides call it, or in Northern Scotland, call it travailing prayer. Like the Holy Spirit groaning through them, they said, like a woman travailing in labor, like Paul in Galatians 4, 19, travailing as if in the pangs of childbirth that Christ might be formed in you. And they said, ever since I looked into the eyes of those people who once saw what we so passionately want to see, I've come to believe that the true seedbed of awakening is the plowed up hearts of men and women willing to receive the gift of travail. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy, Psalm 126, verse 5. That prayer is the precursor to the work of God. Always the preparatory, anticipating, active awakening is not a new idea. But this may be the type of praying that has been lost. Not in Christian communities of Asia or Africa or Latin America, but somehow forgotten in the West. This was the praying of the Hebrews who groaned in their slavery and cried out in Exodus 2. And God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant. This was the prayer of Hannah for a child overcome to the point of being understood as intoxicated in her petitions. As in 1 Samuel 1, I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Hezekiah in 2 Kings 2. 19, took his desperation to the temple and spread it out before the Lord. As Jehoshaphat said in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we have no power to face this vast army, but our eyes are on you. In Nehemiah 1, when Nehemiah heard the news of Jerusalem's brokenness, Nehemiah sat down and wept, then fasted and prayed for days. This is the prayer of the prophets, that we give God no rest. That we cling to God as a loincloth clings to a man's waist in Jeremiah 13. That we go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts in Zechariah chapter 8. That the priests might weep between the portico and the altar in Joel chapter 2. Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees to pray for relief from drought in 1 Kings 18. Scholars say it was the posture of a woman giving birth. Daniel 9 says he turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition for Jerusalem. This is the praying of the Psalms. In Psalm 119, streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. In Psalm 88, day and night I cry out before you. In Psalm 142, listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. This was the praying of Jesus who offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him. In Hebrews 5, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Luke 19, 41, he blessed those with spiritual hunger and thirst, and he taught those who followed him to keep on asking and seeking and knocking. I could go on and on in Colossians about commending someone for always wrestling in prayer for you, the Spirit interceding for us with groanings too deep for words, and then in Revelation, the only recorded prayer of the Holy Spirit is the urgent cry, come, which when united with the prayer of the church is addressed to Jesus, beckoning his thrice-repeated response, I come quickly. And hear this line from David Thomas. The Bible seems utterly unfamiliar with casual prayer. Prayer of the mouth and not the heart. Travail, a kind of burdened, focused pressing, seems closer to the throbbing core of prayer in Scripture. Tertullian, who was an ancient uh, early church father in North Africa, considered prayer a kind of holy violence to God. Origen in the second century believed that to weeping and weeping alone, God will pay attention. So many, so many other examples to be listed, but... Um, Duncan Campbell, who was a key leader of this Hebridean uh, revival, used to preach, let us be honest in the presence of God and get right into the grips of reality. Have I a vision of our desperate need? Oh, for a baptism of honesty, for a gripping sincerity that will move us. Um, and from me, I long for our church to be ridden with radical honesty no pretending, no facades, no trying to be impressive, just people hungry, desperate, 
calling out for God, anticipating the presence of God. Jesus is worthy of our pursuit. He's worthy of all adoration, all glory, all power and honor forever. The question is, what do you want? What is it that you want from him? And if you, like me, long for more of Jesus, we need less of us. A prayer for more of you, less of me. In order to see reality for what it is and what we need, we need a diagnosis. This could be a whole sermon in and of itself, but one of the ways the biblical authors get at this is through talking about this concept of sin, and it's a multifaceted concept that uses a number of different words in the Hebrew Scriptures. But as Tyler Staten described, sin is shorthand for any attempt to meet our deep needs by our own resources. There's a number of different ways that sin plays out. There's sin that is in the world the brokenness, the evil, the destruction that we just see that's there. There's sin that is done to you. Not that you did, but someone hurt you. Someone did something that was wrong to you. And there's also sin that is done by you, sin that you perpetuate. And I found this so fascinating in Staten's book. Um, He pointed out that in the biblical imagination, talking about sin was not an accusation or a condemnation. And to be honest, even preaching and talking about sin, I just know that's kind of how I tended to feel growing up. It felt like just like a pointed accusation, like how dare you do that? And I felt really guilty. But in the biblical imagination, it's not an accusation. It's not a condemnation. It's a statement of reality. It's a diagnosis. It's a walking into the doctor's office and them saying, you naming your symptoms and them saying, let me tell you the problem. Uh, My dad uh, is an ER physician and has been for... um, I don't know, 40 years or something, and he has all sorts of crazy, crazy stories. Um, But increasingly what I hear from him and other people in the medical profession is that with the advent of the internet and people going on WebMD um, and other places, before they come in, people come in and say, this is what I need. And not only here is my problem, but here's the medication I need to get from you. And of course, my dad, being a seasoned veteran, and that is like, no, like that's not how this, this relationship works. And with God, in the same way, we need an honest labeling of our symptoms and be open to what him, he, our great physician and healer, will say to us to receive the healing and forgiveness that we need. As Staten wrote, to confess our sin is to say, I want to name my symptoms completely and comprehensively because I want healing completely and comprehensively. He describes confession, and this is such a good line, as a terrifying gift, which sounds like a contradiction because it is. It is both terrifying and it is good for you. And what we see in the beginning of the Bible is where Adam and Eve sin against God. They go and they hide. The alternative to hiding is a stubborn refusal to hide. No matter how uncomfortable it gets, an insistence on exposing ourselves to God. And that's the only way, Staten writes, to open ourselves up to unconditional love. We make a big mistake uh, in the Western church in particular when we assume that spiritual maturity means that you have less things to confess. When actually the work of spiritual maturity and growing into Christ-likeness is like a work of inner excavation of realizing how bad actually the problem is. The further I get into my life with Jesus, the more I realize I've got sin that I need to confess. Sin that's been there a lot longer than I've been aware. Robert Mulholland Jr. in his book, Invitation to a Journey, outlined four sort of layers to sin um, that I find really helpful. Uh, I used to do student ministry, um, and I just know my own perception of sin when I was uh, younger, middle school, high school, was very much just pertaining to like actions and like really big, bad things. And so you say, well, I'm a pretty good person, like I haven't killed anybody, like I'm not in the, you know, I'm not doing whatever your thing is that you like demonize, like I'm not doing that. I'm a pretty good person, I don't really need to confess that. The biblical imagination of sin is about a lot more than like the action, it's like a, that's like the tip of the iceberg. Robert Mulholland Jr. out described four layers of it. Um, one was uh, gross sins, is what the ancients referred to them as. Not gross as an ooh, but gross as an obvious. Like, this is really clear, this is bad. Murder, prime example. Generally, across the board, Christian, not Christian, don't do that one. Underneath that would be what he referred to as conscious sins. These are things that you are aware of. 
that you know this is not God's best for me, but they're perhaps more socially acceptable. Under that, you might find things like greed, uh, materialism, um, lying to make yourself look better, uh, fudging your resume, I mean, whatever kind of thing you want to put in there. Underneath that is what he referred to as subconscious sins. In other words, these are the sins that you have that you are not aware of yet. Which that's kind of terrifying to think about, isn't it? I realized, like, for me, I was always, like, really insecure growing up. Um, and still can struggle with that, like, insecurities. And so I was really convinced I wasn't prideful. Super convinced. And, of course, it was kind of a wake-up call for me to realize, oh, no, 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 no. Mine is a, it's straight up pride is what that was. And it's not that it's new. It's been there a very long time, but the Holy Spirit revealed it to me in his own time. Even recently, without divulging into too many details of it, like there was something in my life that I thought was just a result of like things that have happened to me, like a fear that I had. And I realized that for me, the Holy Spirit convicted me. It's not just what happened to me anymore. It's something that I now am perpetuating. And I asked the Lord to like search me and know me and convict me of things. And even that one, I was like... <sighs> I want to go the direction that you have for me. It was like an avoidance of conflict was what it was. Um, and I was like, I, but I know, I have a general idea because I've been walking with you for a while, what you're going to tell me to do. You're going to give me opportunities to have conflict, and I do not want that. But okay, God, I want you. I want you. And I want you more than I want to avoid conflict. I want you. I want to walk in obedience to you. Would you heal me? Would you forgive me? Would you work on this within me? Then the last layer was what he referred to as trust structures or idols, which Tim Keller uh, defines as an idol as anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. And uh, I think for me growing up, like, the language of idol was also weird because I'm like, I don't, like, bow. I personally don't, like, bow down to, like, another, um, another god or anything like that, right? But uh, idols can be good things that you turn into god things. Idols can be things that are even really good in your life that you instead begin to worship at the altar of. In other words, that you dedicate your life to the pursuit of all of these things, whether that's money, fame, success, a relationship, that you dedicate your life to getting these things. So what's the response? One is to recognize that there is deep healing and forgiveness that it comes in the person of Jesus. The good news is way better than the bad news. As Staten points out, confession is two parts. One is searching. That's kind of what we did earlier. And then naming. Searching, he says, is God's part. Lord, search me and know me. Reveal these things to me. And the second is naming. That's your part. That's my part. And you will, if you choose to embark on this endeavor, you will feel resistance. You will feel scared. You will debate whether or not it is worth it. You will wonder. I still wonder at times before I do it, but I'm always thankful that I did. Resistance is to be expected. Adele Calhoun in her book, Spiritual Disciplines, hand, hand Spiritual Disciplines Handbook um, describes how we're invested in looking like good moral people. And on a practical note, confessing your sin uh, is basically opening up yourself to saying, I am not. No matter how I may present to you, the problem is a lot worse than what you're aware of. And I know I try to be honest and authentic even from up here and tell you the things, but it's actually a whole lot worse than I've said up here. And the crazy part is I don't even know all of it yet. But the point of confessing our sins isn't just to get a therapeutic release. The point is not simply to confess. It's union. It's love. It's intimacy. It's acceptance. It's forgiveness with Jesus. Jesus frequently spoke harshly to the self-righteous, those who thought they had it all together, and he welcomed the sinners who knew they were in need of a Savior. And so what I want to do is I invite um, Carly uh, to come back up and uh, lead us um, in, in worship. 
is I think there's a number of us in the room in response to last week have come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened. There's some in the room that are just carrying heavy burdens that are not necessarily because you have done something wrong to earn it or deserve it or anything like that, but it is just a deep, painful burden that you feel. And others of us, as we were praying, we felt the Holy Spirit illuminate things in our lives that we need to bring to him. Both of these postures in a very real sort of sense are a crying out in desperation, God, I need you. God, I need you. I'm at the end of my rope. I've tried. I've, I, I literally don't know what else to do. I need you. Will you show up? Will you be here? It's an invitation to trust. Um, in, in his book, Staten describes a conversation with a woman named uh, Jenna who'd lost a loved one. Uh, due to cancer, um, and she said that she chose, eventually chose to trust, not a trust that God willed this, or, but a trust that God is good, that God is present in our suffering, and that God will make all things new. So what I want to do is I want to end this with, with the invitation that I want to pray for us from Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to him. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and he will give you rest. Take his yoke upon you. Let him teach you, for he is gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For the yoke he gives you is easy to bear, and the burden he gives you is light. Will you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit. Search us and know us, oh God. God, I pray that um, you cause us to just hunger for you, to be desperate for you. God, I, I confess that I go to satiate my appetite, my hunger, this deep longing that I feel via things that don't ultimately satisfy me. I'm reminded of the story in the Garden of Eden where they go and they take from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil rather than trusting in you. God, help us, help me to trust in you over my own desires. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Fix our eyes, fix our heart, fix our attention on you. God, I'm just reminded all the time, we don't come here just to hear a clever word. We don't come here just to, God, we come here to know you, to encounter you, to be with you. God, you are good, you are worthy, you are pursuing us. God, I pray that as people um, come to you and they bring their sin, they bring their burdens to you, or that they just experience what Luke chapter 15 talks about, where the, where the father of the son who ran off is just waiting with open arms to embrace and throw a party that they came back. Um, and so, God, as we bring these things to you, I pray that we, you silence the voice of the enemy, that you silence the voice of our inner critic that uh, yell at us with condemnation, but instead we hear the words that sound like you, that you love us, that you're for us, that you are kind and gentle. Be with us, God. We long for more of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching the service. We pray that it blessed you and helped you grow closer to God. If you are in the Nashville area, we'd love for you to join us sometime. If you're not in the Nashville area, we'd love to help you get connected with the local church if you don't already have one. We pray that God blesses you this week and that he grows you closer in your relationship with him and with your community, that he uses you in a powerful way to be a vessel of his good news in everywhere that you go. May God bless you.